the big data lecture. It's great to see all of you here. I'm uh, Partha Talukdar from SERC and CSA. Uh, so today we have two very exciting talks. Uh, so the first one will be by uh, the, uh, Rajiv Prastogi from Amazon and the second one from S. Anand uh, on visualization. So, uh, so we'll start off with uh, Rajiv's talk. Uh, so Rajiv leads the, uh, he's the director of machine learning at Amazon. Uh, he's probably like the closest external speaker that we have because Amazon's office is right here in the uh, World Trade Center. Uh, so before uh, Amazon, he was uh, with Yahoo Research here in Bangalore. He was also the uh, Bell Labs fellow uh, before that. And uh, so he has a very illustrious career. Uh, you know, he has more than hundreds of papers, uh, about 50 plus uh, patents. Uh, he's on the uh, editorial board of CACM and also of the IC, the data engineering uh, transactions. So uh, he did his uh, PhD from University of Texas, Austin, and he did his undergrad in computer science from IIT Bombay. So without uh, much uh, delay, uh, let's uh, welcome Rajiv uh, for the talk. Okay, okay thanks. thanks for the introduction. Uh, delighted to be here at uh, IIC. Um, okay, yeah, let me just get this. I have a lot of uh, students from here. I know they're some of the best. Uh, so, okay, let's get started. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, in my talk is, uh, you know, uh, describe some of the machine learning problems that we are working on at Amazon. Uh, and uh, it's come as no surprise, there are numerous applications of machine learning. Um, across our different business verticals. And this, uh, you know, I know there is a big boom around uh, e-commerce in India, and everybody is super excited about buying stuff online at 20% lower prices. So all those companies will, uh, you know, have many of these problems in some uh, form or the other. So uh, this is sort of quite representative of the sort of problems e-commerce companies would would tackle uh, using machine learning. For example, on the retail side of our business, we use machine learning to uh, forecast future product demand. Uh, and these forecasts need to be fairly accurate, because if you uh, forecast the demand to be too high, then you're going to be stuck with excess inventory that you have to store, and it costs money. Uh, and if you, of course, forecast the demand to be too low, uh, you know, you're going to be out of stock. And that leads to unhappy uh, customers. Right? We're also using machine learning uh, to predict uh, the lowest competitor prices uh, for a product. At Amazon, we like to offer the uh, lowest prices out there. And of course, we can't really crawl all millions of products on the web uh, to figure out what the lowest competitor price will be. So we have to do some kind of predictions. And that's where we use machine learning. Uh, it's also interesting work we're doing on uh, looking at co-purchase patterns of products to find substitutes. Uh, so, you know, uh, products uh, that I could show to a user um, if I'm out of stock on some, uh, uh, you know, substitute product, right? So this, again, leads to a much better customer experience, being able to mine uh, substitute products just based on looking at buying and viewing patterns uh, of our, of our uh, products. Uh, Amazon, of course, has been a pioneer in the area of recommendations. Uh, we proposed uh, collaborative filtering algorithms way back uh, in the uh, mid-1990s. We actually started the whole area of, you know, uh, uh, that kind of led a, uh, to a lot of excitement around uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, and most of you have probably seen the widget that we have on customers who bought this, also bought. And that widget uh, is uh, powered by very uh, scalable data mining algorithms that compute frequent co-purchase. Uh, we also use uh, machine learning for ranking search results. Um, um, uh, and also uh, uh, predicting ad click and conversion probability. Right? And uh, of course, customer targeting uh, uh, involves, again, uh, developing models to predict the propensity that a customer would purchase a product. and then. Uh, you know, you target customers uh, with, with products over email uh, that they would be most interested in buying. 
you know, we have a, a, one of the largest marketplaces uh, uh, with over 2 million sellers. Right? For these sellers, we offer a lot of analytics. For example, we'll recommend products that these sellers can sell so that they can grow their revenues and their businesses on Amazon. Uh, we, we send them alerts if they price their products too high or they're going to run out of stock and so on. And then, uh, you know, one of our biggest assets is really our catalog. Uh, this is, again, uh, over a billion products in our catalog, uh, you know, probably the largest collection of products on the planet. Um, and a key challenge for us here is classifying these hundreds of millions of products that we have into our product taxonomy, which has over 20,000 leaf nodes. Uh, and um, our customers browse through this product taxonomy to discover products. So accurate classification, um, or, uh, product classification is, is really key to product discovery. Uh, and then there's the age-old problem of record link uh, linkage. Uh, many sellers on our marketplace may list the same product, and we have to figure out duplicate products, right? So identifying these duplicates is important for credit, you know, many applications. For example, in search, you don't really want to show duplicate products as part of search results because, again, that will lead uh, to a poor customer experience. Uh, reviews, again, are a huge asset for Amazon. Customers browse through these reviews when they're making very critical uh, product purchase decisions. Here, again, we're using machine learning for ranking reviews, extracting attribute rating pairs from reviews, and so on. Uh, another problem, uh, which is not only uh, you know, on Amazon, but any of these sites like TripAdvisor, where people actually look at reviews to, uh, you know, uh, reserve hotel rooms or buy products and so on, uh, uh, making sure that uh, you don't have fake reviews or fraudulent reviews, right? And this could be with uh, competitors putting negative reviews about you or uh, from the proprietor of that uh, or the sellers themselves uh, writing good reviews about their own products. So detecting those fraudulent reviews uh, is also an interesting challenge for us that we're working on. And we're applying machine learning to many problems in the text domain. Uh, for example, summarizing product reviews and descriptions so that they can fit in the small form factors of mobile devices and sm uh, smartphones. So really being able to generate these very concise sum summaries is extremely important. We also have stuff going on in uh, visual search. So we have an app that will allow users to point their phones to a product and then retrieve visually similar uh, products from our catalog. Uh, we also have uh, you know, speech recognition uh, software and applications that are all powered by uh, deep learning. So there's a lot of work going on on the images uh, and uh, the speech side as well uh, within the company. And finally, uh, you know, uh, most of you have uh, looked at or used or know about Mechanical Turk, which is a very popular crowdsourcing platform where uh, you know, you can get uh, a lot of tasks like uh, image and document labeling done very cost effectively. Here again, we are using uh, machine learning to compute reputation scores for uh, Mechanical Turk workers, and then we use those reputation scores when we are scheduling tasks to workers. So a broad set of problems, uh, I mean, it's not uh, 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 exhaustive, but it's quite representative of the different types of work that we are doing at Amazon. Whoops. Okay. Right. okay, so let me uh, go a little bit more in depth about uh, on a few problems, right? So I talked about uh, forecasting product demand. Now, um, uh, you know, they say in the airline industry, if you can forecast the future price of oil, then you're in pretty good shape and you can beat out all your com competitors, right? Similarly, in the retail industry, uh, if you can really forecast what your uh, product demand will be in the future, then you can order just the right amount of a product and, 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 and you're going to run a very efficient business, especially where the margins are so low, right? So this is an important problem for us. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it is challenging uh, uh, on many fronts. First of all, uh, you know, at Amazon, this is a, a constant theme uh, you're going to see is scale. Everything is in the millions, uh, you know, uh, customers are like over 200 million, uh, products are over a billion. So you're dealing with fairly large amounts of data uh, for which uh, you want to run these, uh, you know, uh, turn out these forecasts. 
And then there is the uh, you know, standard whole start problem. And again, this you're going to see it uh, as a theme across all the applications that we work on. And just because the environment is very dynamic, you have products. Uh, we have thousands of new products that get listed each day by sellers. Right? It's a very dynamic environment. It's not a static environment. You have new products coming in that have no past demand. So you have no data, past data about these products. And you, you still have to make predictions without, a, uh, without past data, because you want to plan for even new product launches. Uh, parsity is another problem uh, that uh, uh, you know, plagues many of the problems uh, uh, that we work on. And, and, and this is uh, typical of most applications. There is huge skew in the underlying data, right? Uh, 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 most of our products sell very little in terms of items, right? There's a head uh, set of products which actually get the most demand, right? Uh, I, I'm sure you can guess what those head items are, but they, they're, they're going to include things like mobile phones and so on, right? Uh, so there's a huge tail. Uh, and that's where I think the, the, the challenge comes about, is how do you pre predict what the demand for that tail is? Right? Um, seasonal uh, patterns are, are also something that your models have to take into account. So you have some products that have demand during the summer. There are other products that sell a lot during winter. And then there are demand spikes. right? So some are planned, some are unplanned. The planned ones are like, you know that sales are going to shoot up in, uh, during Diwali or Christmas or uh, Mother's Day, and and sometimes it's unplanned. You know, there's a snowstorm, and all of a sudden people are ordering uh, shovels, right? So how do you deal with demand spikes? Uh, and the final point is is uh, perhaps the most important. Most machine learning um, uh, models will uh, return a prediction, right? There's a single value, and that's typically the average demand or the average quantity uh, that you're try that you're interested in the prediction. But for many applications, the average is not good enough. And, and this is one application where uh, you really want the complete probability distribution over the demand. That's because uh, you know, uh, at Amazon, we don't want customers to ever see a product be out of stock. Right? So we want, to, uh, we want to order products based on 90th percentile or the 95th percentile of demand. Right? So there's a 95% chance that uh, any time a customer comes to Amazon, they're going to see the product in stock. So, uh, so the, uh, the entire probability distribution is what's important to us. And then we actually, our ordering systems will look at very high quantiles of, of the demand and then order based on that. And it, anyways, in general, um, you know, just a single prediction is, is sort of meaningless, right? It's an average. But what's the confidence in that prediction? What are the confidence intervals? What are the error bars? Those are equally important. So, uh, uh, so I think in general, uh, it, it's good to know not only the prediction, but it's also good to know the entire uh, confidence intervals if you want to do things like explore, exploit, and so on when you're deploying your machine learning models. Product search, uh, uh, you know, this is again a, uh, an area that's very important because th this is how customers actually discover products on Amazon. And here again, uh, you know, we have the uh, usual challenges of scale and new products. Uh, uh, coming in uh, because we have to you know, figure out a way to show some of the new products that get listed as part of our search results, uh, because that's one way we can drive sales of those products. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, many of these applications are real-time applications. So you, you have only about uh, 40 milliseconds or so, or even less, to compute all the search results. Right? So you've got to go through uh, thousands of uh, different results and then figure out what are the eight or 10 products you want to show the, uh, show the user. And all of it has to do, be done uh, in real time. And uh, of course, I mean, if you want to improve the relevance of your results, you need to understand the semantics of your search query. This involves segmenting your query, identifying phrase, uh, phrases. You may also you know, want to uh, recognize what the intent of the customer is. Is the customer looking to buy a, pro a very specific product? Uh, in which case, you probably want to show product listings from many different sellers and the prices for those listings. right? Uh, or the customer is looking to sort of just research the product. He's very early in the sales funnel, in which case you probably want to focus more on reviews, expert articles, and so on. right? And, and, uh, and of course, you can also improve relevance by determining the category for the search query. 
uh, and then filter out all products that don't fall in that category. Uh, uh, at Amazon, we are also building a knowledge graph over products. So this contains various attributes of products, like you know the brand, the price, the dimensions of products, so various various specifications for products, and also relationships between products. I talked about substitutes earlier, so relationships like accessories and uh, sequels, uh, substitutes, and so on. And uh, and the, and having this knowledge graph can help us improve the quality of our search results because when you get uh, when you when you are showing the results for a search query you can also show uh, you know structured abstracts that contain various uh, product uh, specifications uh, you can show related products these can be your you know typical substitutes complements sequels and so on so you could also show a lot of related products as part of your search results that uh, helps to improve the customer experience uh, moving on to product classification, I, I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have this uh, very giant product taxonomy that customers browse through to discover products. Uh, for example, here the rain boot is is in a particular path uh, or within this taxonomy, and then we use uh, attributes like the title, which is shown here, uh, and and the description uh, to make these classification uh, uh, decisions. Uh, like I said, uh, this is a fairly giant taxonomy with over 20,000 leaf nodes, right? So this is a fairly challenging multi-class classification problem, which has some structure in terms of a hierarchy, but but still, it's a it's a fairly large-scale problem classification problem, and many of these classes are very uh, difficult to distinguish. For example, you know, men's t-shirts and women's t-shirts, right? There's just a single word that differentiates them. <coughs> the entire product may be the same, but uh, there's a gender associated word there. Similarly, products versus accessories. You have the product and you have a tag of either an adapter or a battery or something like that. So it's that word that makes something an accessory versus a product. And distinguishing these at that scale uh, does become a challenge. Um, uh, there are very <coughs> short titles that you have to use to make uh, your classification uh, decisions. Typically, there are, you know, titles are just 10 or 15 words long. And, and, and the real world isn't uh, pretty. You know, there's a lot of noise in your labels. Uh, you know, some of our data sets have uh, almost 30% uh, noise, incorrect, uh, uh, you know, target label. Your classifiers have to be robust uh, to noise in your target. Uh, and of course, there's also skew. I mean, of these 20,000 classes, some classes have over a million examples, while others have less than uh, less than 100. So there's an extreme imbalance in the in the types of uh, you know in the distribution of classes uh, within your training data. So so your algorithms have to be both robust to noise in the training uh, you know uh, the labels as well as robust to the uh, imbalance amongst classes. Product matching, uh, again, uh, you know, when many sellers list the same product, you end up with duplicates. Here, again, is an example of, you know, three products listed by three separate sellers. <coughs> they all correspond to the same underlying product. They have different titles, they have different images, but they, they, but they are, uh, you know, it's the same underlying product. And one of the unique characteristics of our environment is we require very high precision when you do the matching, uh, because this is used for applications like pricing, you know, uh, the way we price products is we, we find all the product listings that are for that product and then select the lowest uh, competitor price <coughs> or something along those lines. So clearly here if you, if you match wrongly and take an accessory along with the main product, you may end up, uh, you know, pricing your product uh, incorrectly because all this is automated, right? So. So uh, the high precision is what makes this problem ex especially challenging. And this is a you know, well-studied uh, record linkage problem, which has sort of been, you know, people have been working it, on it for 20, 25 years. It's still uh, unsolved. Uh, and it, what uh, makes it even more difficult is the high precision requirement. And of course, what, what's a duplicate is also very subjective. Uh, you know, in some ca product categories, uh, different colors may be still a duplicate, but other categories like apparel, different colors actually may be very important and uh, so may, they may become 
you know, be treated as separate products. Um, and um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier about reviews. So, so we do do some processing of reviews uh, within Amazon. So, for example, we look at frequently occurring snippets within the reviews, right? And these are surfaced out, as you can see here. Uh, we we show some of those more prominently occurring themes within the reviews uh, to help users, uh, because you know you can have thousands of reviews for certain pro uh, products and. Uh, having users, you know, go through all these reviews uh, is definitely going to be very tedious. We also collect star ratings uh, from users at a very coarse-grained level at the product granularity, and then we aggregate these star ratings and show the user um, a, a sort of summary like this. But what uh, what would be really be valuable is if we could, you know, analyze these reviews and extract ratings based on the tone of the review for uh, uh, you know, uh, fine-grained attributes of products. So, for example, it would be great if I could, you know, go through these reviews, automatically analyze them, and figure out that for an iPhone, uh, on camera quality, people rate it as four, and on, um, uh, you know, <coughs> screen size or battery life, it's rated as uh, three, and so on. And, and uh, that's based on analyzing all the reviews, get these ratings, uh, from the reviews uh, at a very fine-grained product attribute level, right? So that's something that we are working on, and again, that's very challenging because, uh, first of all, you know, even knowing which attributes are important for a product is not obvious, right? Especially when you have uh, 100 million products, doing this manually is, is, is difficult. So can you uh, extract what attributes or what aspects are very important for a product just based on looking at the reviews? And of course, different products will have different attributes that are important. So for smartphones, you you know, battery life and uh, camera quality may be important. For a washing machine, you know, size and capacity may be more important. Right? Um, uh, of course, there's a uh, there are synonyms. Many terms may refer to the same attribute. Uh, reviews have informal and uh, very diverse styles. Uh, you know, reviewers have their own styles of writing. And of course, I mean, if you want to extract ratings from reviews, then you've got to do sentiment analysis. And that, again, requires natural la uh, language understanding techniques. It requires um, you know, deep parsing of sentences and so on. So uh, let me, uh, this is the final uh, uh, application I'll, I'll talk about. And then I'll go a little bit deeper into some of the work we're doing in product uh, recommendations at, at Amazon. So. Um, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as I, uh, most of you guys have seen this, customers who bought this also bought widget on the Amazon detail page. This has been around for, you know, uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, but that doesn't uh, uh, offer users personalized recommendations. It basically computes, uh, you know, what are frequently purchased or viewed items or products with a given product, right? So it, it's the same set of products for every user. Right. So one of the things that we want, uh, we are, you know, that we've been doing, and we've launched a couple of uh, <clears throat> uh, products around this, is personalizing those recommendations. So, um, so now what we do is, uh, you know, learn uh, a customer's preferences based on their past uh, history of browsing and purchases and so on, and then show uh, products that would be most relevant or or of more most interest to them, uh, exploiting various. Uh, contextual signals, right, where the location of the user, the time of the day, and so on, to, to, to make uh, more uh, uh, relevant recommendations, again, is an area we're working on. And then there's the usual theme of, you know, data sparsity. I'll talk a little bit more about these in my, in my talk, uh, cold start, that, that's also, uh, you know, uh, there with other, uh, other, other areas. So, so le le let me go a little bit deeper into some of the uh, technical work we are doing uh, on recommendations, right? So uh, in recommendation problems, uh, typically what you're given is uh, 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 the input data is a matrix. Uh, you know, you have one dimension representing users, another dimension representing items, right? And these items could be products, ads, mo movies, music, and so on, right? And uh, matrix entries here are, um, are ratings that capture the interest that the user has in a product, right? 
so for example, Netflix collects star ratings for uh, movies and so on. And the problem is uh, predicting a rating RIJ for a uh, user item pair IJ. Okay. And uh, this is a well-studied uh, problem. Uh, you know, uh, early techniques were uh, based on uh, neighborhood methods. They computed, estimated the rating uh, that a user gives an item based on ratings for the item by similar users. <coughs> and similar users were typically, uh, you know, users who have similar ratings uh, to your given user, right? But more recently, matrix factorization techniques have, uh, you know, become one of the dominant methods for solving these uh, sort of recommendation problems. And what matrix uh, factorization models do is they map uh, users and items into a joint latent factor space of dimensionality R, right? So each user I is now associated with a latent factor UI, and this is shown here. And you have a latent factor uh, a VJ associated with every item J, right? And these, these have dimensionality of R, right? And, uh, the elements of, intuitively, the elements of uh, VJ measure, uh, you know, how much, uh, to what extent these, uh, this item possesses different item characteristics. For example, for movies, you know, the uh, uh, factors may uh, measure different dimensions, like the genre of the movie, maybe comedy versus drama, um, uh, you know, amount of uh, violence or action in the movie, orientation to children, and so on. And then for the users, the factor measure, uh, the, the factors measure how much the user will like, may like items that score high on the corresponding item factor, right? Uh, now, it may not always be possible to uh, assign a very precise semantic interpretation to these factors, uh, to these R factors that you have. But in general, uh, users that have very similar rating uh, patterns will end up uh, uh, occupying nearing, uh, very nearby coordinates in the latent space. So similarly, uh, you know, items that have very similar rating patterns will tend to occupy neighboring coordinates in the latent space, right? So, uh, and, and, and then the dot product of UI and VJ uh, actually captures user I's rating for item J, okay? So that, uh, and, and this is um, uh, sort of the, you know, capturing the interaction between user I and uh, item J. And, and what you typically do is you, for each user, you com uh, compute the rating for all the items using the dot product of their latent factors, and then you recommend the, the highest rated uh, item to a user. Now, um, so the major challenge here now becomes, how do you compute these mappings from users and items to these latent factors UI and VJ, right? So one can learn these uh, latent factors uh, uh, to minimize the regularized square error. So, you know, you have this is your uh, square error term, and this is your regularization term, right? And, and this is uh, a term you add because the goal here is to really uh, generalize these previous ratings that you have seen to predict future unknown ratings, right? And, uh, and uh, there, uh, uh, there's always a danger that if you learn from what you've observed in the past, you're going to overfit the past, right? And you're not going to generalize too well uh, to the future. And so what the regularization term here does is it um, uh, sort of uh, penalizes high, uh, uh, high magnitudes for these factors, and it forces them to be low, right? Uh, now, you can use uh, stochastic gradient descent or any other online algorithm to learn these factors that minimize the regularized squared error for each rating RIJ, what SGD will do is it will update UI and VJ by a magnitude proportional to eta in the opposite direction of the gradient of the loss function. So this is the gradient of the loss function, this is the loss function here, and this is the gradient of the loss function, and here's the learning rate that's used to sort of, uh, 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 you know, uh, appropriately weigh the gradient that's used to update the various uh, uh, parameters here. Now, SGD, one of the good things about SGD is it can scale to large data sets because it examines one training example at a time, right? And one more thing to note about this loss function here is that uh, it is, uh, it's, it's not convex. And because of the uh, product term that you have, UI, VJ, uh, your uh, loss function may have multiple local minima. And so if you use gradient descent method, you may not always converge 
to the global uh, global minimum. Yeah. Sure. Right, it's not convex, right? Because uh, you have UI, VJ, both are factors, there's a product term there. So there are many challenges in uh, when you're using matrix factorization. As I mentioned, a uh, data sparsity, most of the entries that you have, yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, but you, you have to use the data that you know and uh, that you've observed, and uh, that you're using that to learn your uh, latent factors, right? And this regularization term here tries to make sure that whatever you learn is general enough, and you're not overfitting the data that you've seen so far. Okay. Yeah. How often? I mean, again, uh, this depends on the application. I mean, uh, uh, there are applications where you relearn models every two hours. There are applications where you may do it daily. Uh, so it, it would depend on the application. How often are ratings coming in? If ratings are coming in very fast, then you want to you wanna retrain more often. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, one option is, um, um, uh, I, I, I mean, you can take multiple samples. Uh, as I go in my talk, uh, probably will become uh, clearer. Okay, yeah. okay. so uh, l l let's move along. Uh, right, so, so some of the challenges, like I said, most of the entries uh, in R will be missing, so you have very few ra uh, ratings uh, usually. So one of the ways to deal with that is to uh, adopt Bayesian approaches. So uh, you know, use probabilistic matrix factorization. So that's what we use in our solutions. So another very interesting problem here is that uh, each user account may actually have multiple personas, right? So there may be many uh, different family members of a of a user who are all using the account, right? So then you have many different uh, entities underlying a user account who are all uh, purchasing items. That could make it difficult to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, factorize the matrix, right? So one of the things that we have to deal with is also, is there a way to identify what the personas are underlying a, a user account? And then there's cold start scenarios where you have new users and items for whom you don't have too many ratings. And here, what we want to do is leverage uh, user and item features, right? For example, for users, there's demographic features about their age, gender, location, and for items, you you know, you have stuff like title, brand, price, uh, category, and so on. So, so let's see how we handle the multiple persona, uh, a user persona problem. So, what we do is, uh, let's say each user may have p personas, right? A max of p personas. We have a separate latent factor, right? Earlier we had a, a single uh, latent factor UI for each user I. Now we have separate uh, latent factors UIK for persona K of user I. We, so, so we introduce these new latent factors and we have a, la a new latent variable ZIJ that captures the user persona that was responsible for each rating RIJ. So here in this figure, the user three has two personas uh, you know, and persona one was responsible for this rating, and persona two was responsible for this rating. And of course, the rating for uh, by of your user i for item j now uh, becomes the product of ui, zij, and vj, right? Where zij is the persona of user i that was responsible for the rating r i j. Right? So, so now the pro challenge here is uh, we, we we you know you want to you want to infer the personas also. So your inference algorithms, in addition to learning what UI and VJ are, they would also have to figure out for each rating what the ZIJs were. And, and another uh, uh, interesting thing that we do is uh, incorporate features into the model as well. 
traditional collaborative filtering models don't have features, right? It's just the rating matrix. But uh, you may have additional features like demographics information, right? How, and for items, you have additional information like title and category. How do you incorporate this information into your model, right? So the way we do that is uh, we assume that every one of these latent factors is now uh, is drawn from a Gaussian whose mean is actually a regression uh, over the uh, over the user features, right? Earlier in traditional matrix factorization. You draw these uh, latent factors from a Gaussian whose mean is zero, and similarly for uh, item latent factors, you draw the latent factors again from a Gaussian distribution whose mean is again derived by performing a regression over uh, the item features. Right. So here again, yj is your item feature vector, and b is your regression matrix. Right. So that that's that's what you're going to do. Into, uh, to incorporate the features into the model, right? It's no longer a zero uh, mean Gaussian prior, but you have a prior with whose mean is, uh, is derived from the features, right? So even if there are new items now, you can, you can just use the mean uh, as the latent factor for, the, for, for, for new users or new items. That's the key idea there. And uh, so here's the generated model. Uh, uh, you know, you draw your uh, uh, persona distributions, theta i, from a Dirichlet distribution that has a concentration pa parameter alpha. You draw your user latent factors uik from a Gaussian whose mean is ak xi. Here again, xi is the uh, user feature vector. ak is the regression matrix that you have for persona k. Uh, again, you draw your item latent factors from a Gaussian with mean uh, byj. And then you have your, uh, you know, for each rating, you have to have your latent variable, right? This is your persona zij that you draw from your multinomial uh, distribution theta i, right? So that's the persona that was responsible for that rating. And then finally, you get your rating that item, uh, you know, user i gives to item j, which is a Gaussian with mean uizij times uh, vj, right? So the inference problem. Uh, now is uh, the key differences here again are in 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 um, you have your personas that are uh, you know are now playing a role in the rating and your uh, means you no know, uh, the means that you have on your priors on both user and item latent factors are no longer zero they're uh, they're uh, obtained by performing regression right so so the inference problem now uh, reduces to finding. Uh, your user and item latent factors, as well as these regression uh, parameters A and B, and also Zij, which are your latent variables that that were responsible for those ratings. Right. So it's a fairly complex uh, inference problem. Here's a graphical model, um, and what we use is a Monte Carlo EM algorithm. So uh, hopefully most of you know what uh, EM is. So we use uh, the uh, a Monte Carlo variant of the EM algorithm uh, to to estimate what these posterior distributions over uh, latent variables and factors is, and also to find maximum likelihood estimates of these regression parameters A, K, and B. Right. So, so uh, essentially in uh, EM you per perform you know these successive iterations of expectation and ma maximization steps. In the expectation step, you uh, estimate the posterior distributions using the current values of parameters. And then in the M step, you, you sort of maximize the expected complete data law, lag, uh, likelihood to find the regression parameters. Now, in our case, uh, you know, if, you, if you've worked out the posterior distribution, you're going to find that it's, it's not available in a clean, closed form. right? So, you, so, so what you have to do is replace the traditional E step with the Monte Carlo E step. Uh, step. And uh, what that does is it approximates the posterior with samples that you draw from the posterior, right? So it's just a, it's just approximating the posterior distribution over latent factors and variables. This this thing here, with with uh, samples that you've drawn from the posterior, and then in the M step, uh, once you have your conditional, uh, you know, your complete data log likelihood, which is out here, uh, you know, you uh, approximate that uh, complete data log likelihood by averaging over the samples, and then you compute your uh, regression parameter values that ma that maximizes this quantity here 
on the M step. So all you're doing in the M step is you're approximating the expected complete data log likelihood by the complete data log likelihood that is averaged over these posterior samples. Okay? Uh, so that's the sort of the overview of the inference algorithm. It's basically a Monte Carlo yeah, EM algorithm. And of course, if you want to draw samples uh, from this posterior distribution, we use Gibbs sampling, and here are the conditional distributions. Uh, if you look at uh, the probability of this variable zij equals k is proportional to the uh, probability of uh, you know the rating rij for uh, user persona k and the, these are this is this quantity here as a fraction of ratings for user i by persona k okay so that's what uh, this probability conditional probability is and similarly you get uh, the conditional probabilities on the user um, uh, latent factors right it's a it turns out to be a Gaussian. It's actually a product of all Gaussian uh, ratings uh, uh, by persona k of uh, user i. So this is this term here. And this is a prior, Gaussian prior on uh, the latent factor u i k. Okay. Uh, and then there's the m step where, again, you know what you do is you try to maximize the expected uh, complete data log likelihood. And this, again, can be solved using uh, straightforward uh, regression techniques or SGD. And you compute these new uh, values uh, for parameters A, K, and G. Okay. So let me just uh, 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 quickly go over to some of the experiments that we've done with our model. So we uh, looked at, uh, you know, we evaluated the PRLFM model that we call it um, uh, over both synthetic and real world data sets. The synthetic data sets were actually generated using the PRLFM uh, generative model that I showed you earlier. Right? And uh, it's a small data set. The main goal was really to see what, what is the impact of adding features and personas. You know, these are the two things that we uh, added to you know, your traditional uh, matrix factorization, probabilistic matrix factorization. So we want to see what's the effect of adding personas and uh, features to the to the model, uh, we made the model richer, and 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 we generated uh, three data sets of different uh, varying sparsity. So, you know, the the most sparse data was just um, you know one percent of those entries in the matrix were filled. Ninety nine percent were empty, right? And, and then you had uh, the two other data sets with varying sparsity. And 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 the movie lens uh, data is a real world data set that is used a uh, fair amount for uh, benchmarking recommendation methods. And uh, this had 943 uh, users and 1682 uh, movies. So the algorithm was primarily the PRLFM uh, model that we had. And uh, you, know, you have the option of adding or dropping features from the model, as well as uh, trying out very uh, different uh, values of k and r. The k is the number of uh, personas, r is the dimensionality, and then uh, you know, if, if k, if, if the value of k is fixed to one, then you get the RLFM model. This was the model that was proposed by Agarwal and Chen in uh, KDD. And then, uh, if you drop the features as well, what you get is traditional uh, Bayesian matrix factorization, right? So, k is equals one, and there are no features. That reduces to just normal Bayesian matrix factorization. So, the the metric that we used to evaluate these compare these different models was root mean square error. So here uh, we show the performance of the PRLFM model uh, with and without features on the most sparse data set that we had. So as you can see here, uh, when features are added to the model, you get a lower RMSEs errors compared to uh, not having features, right? And intuitively, what's going on is this is a sparse data set. So there's only 1% of those entries that are filled. So if you want to find similar users or similar items, just based on the ratings, it's very difficult because there aren't enough ratings in the data right? to, to use to kind of find which users may be similar or which items may be similar. So the features play a, an important role here in helping you find uh, pairs of users that may be similar and pairs of items that may be similar. Right? And that's why on, on, on sparse data sets, Adding features to the to the to the model uh, helps to decrease the error. And 
And here, uh, again, uh, we look at the performance of the model where for these three different synthetic data sets. Um, and again, uh, for very sparse data, what we find is the PRLFM model has uh, the best performance for, uh, you know, uh, K uh, number of personas one and the uh, uh, dimensionality of the latent factors also one. And this is the simplest model you can have with the smallest number of parameters. And again, uh, when the data is very sparse, uh, uh, you know, complex models with more parameters tend to overfit the data. You don't have enough data uh, to learn that many parameters. So. Uh, having smaller number of parameters with k equals 1, r equals 1, small number of uh, personas and a, a smaller dimensionality uh, leads to better accuracy. But as you add more data to the data set, so if you look at Syntrain 2 and Syntrain 3, they have more ratings uh, in your, uh, you add more ratings to your uh, data set, then you can start learning more complex models with more parameters. And, and they, um, um, uh, and, and, and they, they give you better performance. So in this case, uh, we find that with uh, k equals 2 and r equals 1, we get the best performance, the lowest RMSC. And incidentally, that's the, those are the parameter settings that we use to generate these synthetic data sets. So that also shows that our inference algorithms are quite effective in terms of learning these parameters from the observed data, right? Learning the parameters of the model from the observed data. Uh, for the movie lens data set, um, again, we got the best performance uh, uh, in terms of RMSE here when uh, the number of personas is 1 and the uh, uh, dimensionality of the latent factors is around 5. And, 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 and uh, compared to other schemes, our scheme uh, has uh, better performance than many of the um, ML algorithms and ML models that have been published in the literature for the movie lens data set. Uh, there was one data set at the end that uh, we couldn't beat, and that's a much more uh, complex model with nonlinear features and so on. So let, let me just summarize. Um, uh, again, um, uh, you know, hopefully I uh, managed to give you somewhat of an overview of uh, the different applications of uh, machine learning uh, at Amazon, you know, right from recommending products to doing search to forecasting demand for products to uh, estimating ad uh, click probabilities and um, uh, you know talked a little bit more about going deeper into uh, recommendations by modeling uh, you know personas multiple personas within an account and you know trying to infer them from based on observations as well as um, uh, uh, leveraging user and item features to handle cold start scenarios. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we had some experiments with uh, preliminary experiments with synthetic and real life data sets. <clears throat> For sparse data, uh, adding the features is helpful because they help to uh, learn these similarity relationships uh, between users and between items when you don't have enough ratings to learn these similarity relationships. And um, also, uh, you know, as you have more data, possible to learn, uh, uh, you know, the personas underlying the accounts and so on. So that's uh, all I had. Uh, I, maybe there's time for one or two questions. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, I mean, at some level, uh, it, it is some amount of quibbling, I guess, because it's the third, uh, you know, the third decimal placed here. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, depending on the applications, uh, even minor improvements, like uh, uh, if you're looking at something like fraud, even the, th you know, AUC improvement at a third decimal place is something that we pay attention to because the amount of money involved uh, I, I think a small percentage of a very large amount is still a large number. So some of these models are powering a pretty large, uh, you know, you may have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars that they are of decisions that are being made. So even small improvements sometimes 
so it's, it's very dependent on the application. Some applications, it would be noise, because who cares, right? I mean, a little bit of difference. But so it, it just depends on how important that application is um, in your overall scheme of things. So uh, small improvements could translate to a lot of money uh, if, uh, depending on the application. But, uh, but that's a valid point. I mean, sometimes it just becomes a competition of, you know, 0 0.01. So uh, just a curious question, so how long, how much time does PR FLM take on the actual data of user, I mean the real user set by the product set of Amazon, given that it's huge? Yeah, yeah, again, uh, it can, uh, uh, so let's see, um, you know, again, it's not that much slower than uh, using stochastic gradient descent and so on, I mean, the, this stuff can uh, scale, uh, as a matter of fact, there's somebody who's implementing it uh, in Spark, and uh, I, I, I think uh, it may be uh, maybe a factor of two to five, maybe slower than SGD, uh, but uh, uh, you definitely get much more accuracy because of a Bayesian approach, uh, especially when you have sparsity. A lot of these Bayesian approaches give you much better results because of the uh, prior and you don't overfit and so on. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, additional overhead because of the sampling and Gibbs sampling and so on, but that may be a small factor uh, further. But uh, uh, you know, I, we don't have, again, this is sort of work in progress, this is being implemented in Amazon, so uh, I can't give, uh, so that's why I don't have actual numbers for Amazon data. But it's, 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 uh, it's very competitive. I mean, if you use Spark, MLlib, the alternate least square uh, implementation they have there is pretty blazingly fast. Especially, and when you parallelize it, uh, then I think things can happen. Uh, you, you know, even extremely large data sets could be done in a few hours. Yeah, no, it's a, well, I, yeah, that, I think manual intervention when you've got uh, 100 million users is very difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, right now the teams actually have some heuristics for uh, clustering them into personas, right? But clearly that again is not, uh, uh, I mean, it's some hacks, right? Yeah, but even heuristics and hacks, I mean, uh, this is a much more principled way of doing it, right? If you can do it uh, this way, that's the perfect, that's the ideal. It's a principled way of figuring out the personas rather than writing some code to cluster some users' purchases in some way or, uh, yeah. Uh, there's always ways, ha hacky ways of doing it. But this is also at some level doing clustering only, but it's a more principled way of doing clustering. So let's thank Rajiv again for a very interesting talk. And uh, we'll to give a gift. Oh. Uh, so uh, as our token of appreciation, we'd like to give a gift to Rajiv. So I would request uh, Siddharth Berman uh, to come on stage and give it to him. So Siddharth is the latest addition to the CSA faculty. So we're very delighted to have him here. And, uh, thank you. Hi. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much. So, uh, so with that, we move on to the second part of the second talk here, and I request uh, Chandra to come and introduce the speaker. Thank you. So my name is Chandra. I'm a faculty in the EC department. It's a great pleasure to introduce Anand today. Anand is the chief data scientist at Graminer.com, um, and uh, uh, he gives excellent talks, so I will uh, uh, hand over to him right away. He has an, uh, an MBA from uh, IIM uh, Bangalore and a BTEC from IIT Madras prior to this.
Ja, nou ik. The story begins in 1900 actually. <coughs> we were playing around with about a century's worth of weather data, temperature data for every district and said let's see what it looks like when you plot it. So in 1924, 1925, month on month, this is what the pattern of weather looks like. And you can see that <coughs> the, there's waves of summer and winter flowing through the country, right? Green is where it's cool and red is where it's hot. But the north, which is Jammu and Kashmir, is by and large unaffected by all of this. It's cool right through the year. But it was also su surprising and interesting that the west coast is consistently cool right through the year. So based on this, I incidentally ha managed to pick my retirement spot <laughs> when I'm much later. <coughs> but what was bizarre was this flashing spot out here. A district that's hot when the surrounding areas are cool and cool when the surrounding areas are hot. Counter-cyclic geographic behavior. And <coughs> the Ministry of uh, the, the Weather Department for quite some time was plagued by this. They initially thought it was a data problem. They went back and checked. No, it wasn't a data problem. Uh, it, there really is one district where when it's hot in the surrounding areas, it's cool and when it's cool in the surrounding areas, it's hot. And this was unknown for pretty much an entire century. First time that it was spotted was when the data was put together in this particular fashion and uh, they said, okay, this is bizarre. Incidentally, that's Bilaspur in Chhattisgarh. Uh, this counter-cyclic weather phenomenon seems to be known locally. A lot of Naxalites apparently make camp here because it's easier to sleep out in the open in the off seasons. So <laughs> apparently there's a lot of local knowledge about it, but there certainly wasn't data-driven knowledge even though the data has existed for a century. Which has a reason. Ultimately, it sort of begs the question, why would we even want to visualize data? Because sometimes you're not able to see and make sense out of the data. We have been looking at numbers consciously for the last 50 years or so, but we've been looking at, well, we've been hearing stories ever since language has been <coughs> discovered, which is at least 10,000 years. But we've been looking at imagery ever since we as a species have had high ice, which is several millions of years. And today, therefore, in a realm where we have a lot of data, when we're trying to crunch all that data through a device that is absolutely incapable of processing data at small scale, let alone large scale, we aren't doing a great job. And what we therefore need to do is to look at ways of aiding that data consumption. What are the ways in which we can aid that data consumption? One way is to say, I'm going to just expose the data to you. I have the spreadsheet, take it. I have this table, take it, and run with it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But you can also possibly show them the data, simple charts, for instance, which either aggregate or take the data raw one way or the other. But convert the same data with very simple transformations into a visual encoding, and then people are able to get insights out of the data. Or you can add a story to that, an explanation, and say, this is the message that I want you to take away. This is the inference that you draw from the data, which makes it even easier. Or on the other hand, you could provide people an interface by which they can explore it. They can say, I want to construct a hypothesis. I want to test that hypothesis. And therefore, I want to be able to play around with that data. Now, each of these has a trade-off. If I look at it from left to right, just exposing the data or showing the data to somebody is easy from a creator's perspective. I just have to do no or simple transformation. But if I have to provide an explanation, I have to do some work. If I have to provide an interface for exploration, I have to do some work. So the stuff on the right is tougher for the creator. The stuff at the bottom, however, is easy for the consumer. If I'm shown a graph or I'm given an explanation, I know what to do. Or I, I don't have to do anything. You're just telling me the answer. Whereas if you're giving me the data or an interface to explore, then I have to do some work and construct it. And each of these has its place. Each of these has several good examples of where it can be used. And the bulk of this talk is about examples of every one of these four constructs to show you where they could, they could be used and how they could be used. And I'm going to start with just exposing the data. Now, uh, let's not minimize the impact of just exposing the data, but I also want to talk about what we mean by data. Let's take an example. If I were to go to google.co.in and start typing, how do I convert to, Google provides a series of suggestions. The first suggestion is Hinduism, followed by Christianity, followed by Islam, followed by Judaism, right? which in some sense is Google's opinion of the most popular religions to convert to. And right, Hinduism is right there on top in, in India at the moment, followed by Christianity and so on. But did the same search in Australia, the fourth most popular religion is PDF. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> which is bizarre, but then you say, okay, let me take this and extend this as an analogy and see what happens if I do this for various countries. So if, for example, I go to, so I if I take various search phrases, for example, the phrase how to, and start typing that in India, the first suggestion is how to kiss followed by how to lose weight. That's India's second largest priority. This is as of 
this morning, right? followed by how to download YouTube videos and then how to make pizza. So it's interesting that how to make pizza comes below how to lose weight. <laughs> that it, it isn't necessarily always the case. But in the UK, for a very long time, how to make pancakes has been right up there on top. And notice that it's above how to lose weight. Right? So <laughs> clearly conflicting criteria. In Singapore, they're interested in how to grow taller. Or if you pick some other term, like what happens if, right? So right now, what happens if the right eye blinks is the biggest <laughs> concern that India has. <laughs> Until very recently, the second biggest concern was what happens if the left eye blinks. I, I, I don't know what the difference is or why there's a problem. But right now, it's what happens if the white blood count is low. In Singapore, right now, they're very concerned about what happens if you don't vote. But the second biggest concern is what happens if you eat ants. Now, why they want to eat ants, I don't know. <laughs> But now all we're doing here is just exposing data, but this is data of a certain kind, right? It's sort of metadata, it's data about data, it's about data about people's behavior. And even just telling people that this is what is interesting or this is what exists is useful from a sociological research perspective. So I wouldn't minimize the importance of exposing the data, just simplifying the access. What we did here was put together in a single page the data that was coming in from typing out a certain set of commands. So we're just simplifying the access, and that has enormous value, both within enterprises as well as uh, outside. But a step ahead of that is to show people what's happening, simple charts, effectively. One of the earliest cases that we were working with was an electricity board, a state electricity board, and they said, look, we have a simple problem. We have uh, a planned conversion to automated meter readings, and we have some resistance from the union, for obvious reasons, right? They're gonna be laid off. Uh, <clears throat> so we'd like some statistical evidence to demonstrate one of the arguments that we have in favor of automated meter readings, which is that there are a lot of, there's a lot, there are a lot of instances of fraud happening. So uh, here are you know, uh, uh, meter readings for the last 10 years for every single customer in the entire state. This is much more data than we can handle with, than we can understand, but your challenge is to try and get somebody in the union to be able to understand this and to clearly see that there is fraud and therefore strengthening our argument. So we said, fine, let's take the principle of showing the data to a, a natural step. And we created a simple histogram. That this is what it looks like. So <clears throat> the number of customers who have meter readings of 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Right? That's what this histogram is. And what you notice is that it's roughly a log normal curve, which is expected. Very few people with low readings, very few people with high readings. Mostly people are in the middle. But there are spikes. And the biggest spikes are at 50 units, 100 units, 200 units, et cetera which also happen to be the slab boundaries. Now there's a strong economic incentive for people to be at or below a slab boundary because when you go beyond the slab boundary, your tariff changes and therefore you have to start paying a lot more. Right? So which means that this 50 unit spike and this 100 unit spike is very favorable to customers. Now, if you hit exactly 50, great, you're making the most of your slab. Now this can happen in one of two ways. Either you keep watching your meter and the instant it hits 50, you turn off all your lights and fans and no more electricity for the rest of the month or a certain amount of money changes hands, right? which is obviously the far more convenient mechanism and therefore a more rational explanation. So this was fairly strong evidence that there was fraud going on and was used by the Energy Commission. But the other thing that stumped us was why there were spikes at 10, 20, 30, 40, et cetera. There looked was something weird going on. We don't know why your uh, you know, consumers are consuming units at 10 or why they're bribing people to, consume, to mark their readings as round numbers. It just doesn't make sense because there's no economic benefit. And then an energy commissioner looked at us like we were crazy. You're thinking about this the wrong way. This is not fraud. This is laziness. These are the meter readings taken by people who never went to take a meter reading. They're just sitting at office and cooking it up. And when people cook up numbers, they cook up round numbers. <laughs> so you've given me a second reason as to why I should be going in for automated meter readings, which is laziness. Uh, around the same time, we were working with the uh, education department in Tamil Nadu as well. And they said, uh, we have every student's data, right? We have every student's marks in every subject. We have their demographic data. We know their caste. We know their gender. We know all of this. Can you predict a child's marks? Meaning, given the uh, <coughs> socioeconomic background of a child, can you tell me what mark the child is going to get? OK, that's a nice problem. Uh, but let's start with something more basic, shall we? Let's just <coughs> see what your marks distribution is like. And we did the same thing that. Uh, uh, I showed you earlier, which is to look at the distribution of marks in each subject. So how many students got zero marks, one mark, two marks, all the way up to 100 marks in class 10 English. And you'll notice that it's approximately normal. Very few students getting low marks, very few students getting high marks, except that there is a spike, which is at exactly 35 marks. <laughs> and you know what this is. 
So the teachers have been very kind and all the students who would have failed otherwise have been scooped up and pushed just 35 <laughs> or beyond. But notice that this is not consistent. There are still students who fail at 34 or 33 or so on. So which means that it does matter which English teacher corrects your paper. So at least in English, <laughs> there's room for prayer, you know. <laughs> Better hope that if you're a borderline student, the right teacher corrects your papers. But in social sciences, you don't need to pray. <laughs> Nobody flunks between 30 and 35. And between 25 and 30, there's a certain amount of discretion. So people are scooped up from here and tossed out here. But nobody flunks between 30 and 35. So, And the best part is the education department swears that they have no official policy on this. When the education secretary looked at this, why? What's happening here? We have certainly not issued any diktat to any of the teachers to do any of this. And yet the social science teachers somehow seem to have gotten together and decided that nobody will flunk between 30 and 35. While the English teachers, there are some English teachers who even at 34 say, no, you better flunk. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> mathematics is a similar case. Again, nobody flunks between 30 and 30. Right? It's, it's great. Uh, but a couple of uh, anomalies. Uh, one is that this is a bit tall. In fact, I cut it short for consistency with the previous slide. If I were to let it go, it would go slightly beyond the ceiling. Uh, there are over 100,000 students who got exactly 35 marks in mathematics. And despite that, despite the generosity of the mathematics uh, teachers, it's still the subject where there are the largest number of single subject failures. The other, other weird thing about mathematics is that there's a spike at 100 as well. Now, this is interesting. See, the thing about data is that it can tell you what's happening. It doesn't necessarily tell you why. Now, we know that there's something unusual happening here, that there's a spike at 100 as well. Why is that? There are several theories, some testable with this data, some not. One theory is, for example, that mathematics is a very objective subject, then therefore you can actually say that a person has got something right or not, which allows teachers to give a student 100 if they in fact have gotten 100. Plausible. <clears throat> Another explanation that I've heard is that mathematics is bimodal, that there are students who get it and there are students who don't. Computer science is another one of those subjects. So imagine, if you will, a population of class 8 students and class 4 students taking the same exam. You'd have two humps in the curve, one for the class 8 students, one for the class 4 students. And that's because the class 8 students are a different population altogether in terms of skills and abilities compared to the class 4 students. And what this, uh, what this argument argues for is that mathematics, even for the same age group, is like that. And what we're seeing here is the sec, which would have gone beyond 100, where marks beyond 100 are awardable, but has been compressed into 100. And therefore, this represents the students who are significantly better than the rest of the cluster. We don't know. We don't know which of these, or perhaps yet another explanation, is the right one. But it does, to begin with, at least showing the data helps us spot what are the patterns that we need to look for. <coughs> Quick question. Um, <coughs> when we start looking at predicting performance based on socioeconomic characteristics, uh, how many people think boys, on average, score more than girls? <laughs> how many people think, OK, two? How many of you will think girls score more than boys? <laughs> yeah, no, the majority of you are right, of course. Uh, <clears throat> on average, girls do score more than boys. It varies from subject to subject. Uh, in subject like physics, the difference is uh, close enough to zero. But in subject like economics, it's as much as uh, 16 marks out of uh, 8 percentage points, 16 marks out of 200. Uh, but the fact is that consistently, girls tend to outperform boys, at least when it gets to class 10 or class 12. Now, several explanations, again, possible for this. But here's one phenomenon where data does manage to provide a reasoning behind this as well. So one explanation, of course, is that girls are smarter than boys. I'm very happy to accept that. Uh, but a more interesting one is that there is a higher girls dropout ratio. Now, why does that matter? Because uh, if there were two girls, uh, firstly, why do girls drop out? Primarily because of lack of availability of toilets beyond class 8. And uh, where there is a higher girls dropout ratio, it's more likely that the smarter girls tend to stay back in, college, in, in school. Right? That's significantly more likely. And therefore, a higher dropout ratio is also a self-selection process in that which naturally increases the average of the girls. So which means that in regions where there is a higher girls dropout ratio, you'll find that the average of the girls is likely to go up much more than the average of the boys whose dropout ratios are nowhere near as high as the girls. And you do find a fairly strong correlation between the difference in marks 
and the dropout ratios. In Kerala, the difference in marks between boys and girls is much lower than in Chhattisgarh, where the dropout ratios are much higher as well. This seems to be a much stronger indication than any other factor. So, what we do know is that the dropout ratio is a significant contributing factor. It is unlikely to be the only contributing factor, but we do know that it is able to explain the bulk of it. Now, see, we had such good data, we could go reasonably close towards identifying what are the factors that drive a person's marks, and we are looking to visual, looking at various ways of visualizing that. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, <coughs> one of the uh, things that we were trying to do was also evaluate the impact of astrology and numerology. Right? See, we have every child's address, place of birth, age, um, gender, community, whatever. So we can pretty much compute their horoscope. So we went ahead and did that, and you know, stuff like that. So we start off with the question, does the first letter of the name actually have an influence on the child's marks? How many people think the first letter of the name makes a difference to the marks? Two, okay, three, four, oh, okay, hands are going up, not bad. How many people think it does not? Okay, very scientific majority, though in, incidentally, this is the smallest proportion of raised hands that I've seen in any audience, and it's interesting that the Indian Institute of Science has the <laughs> smallest proportion of raised hands for uh, against numerology. Uh, but no, the, uh, those of you raised hands uh, second are right. The first letter of the name seems to have no impact whatsoever on the child's marks. So every year, so for instance in 2014, students whose name began with the letter H had the highest average. Okay, and 2013 it was the letter T, varies from year to year. The difference is in the third decimal place and is absolutely not statistically significant. So yeah, no, uh, first letter of the name does not uh, make a difference. But the name as a whole does seem to make a difference. This is a visual where each box represents one student's name. So students whose name have Kumar are the most popular in Tamil Nadu, followed by Priya and so on. The color of the box represents the average marks these students score. Now, if you look at the students who score relatively high marks, North Indian surnames tend to do relatively well in Tamil Nadu. Jains, Shahs, Agarwals, an average of about 85% as compared to the state average of 65% with like a whopping 20 percentage point difference. <coughs> Names like Shweta, Sneha, Pooja, Varshini, Harini, Sanjana, Deepti, they tend to do extremely well. In contrast, <coughs> names that don't do well, Manigantan, Venkatesan, Yerumalai, Tirupadi, Chilambarasan. So you know what's happening here. Classic urban girls' names as opposed to classic rural boys' names. So yes, there seems to be a correlation, but we are not establishing a causation. The name does not have an impact on the marks, but the same factors that have an impact on the name also have an impact on the marks, the socioeconomic characteristics. Now, having said that, yes, correlation is not causation, but that does not mean that correlation is useless. In fact, if I got two resumes without marks, one from, let's say, a Deep T. Shah and another from a Manikantan, okay, it's pretty easy for me to decide whom to pick, or at least if I were going by marks, right? I know that there's probably a 20 to 30 percentage point difference between Deep T. Shah versus Manikantan if they've taken a, an exam in Tamil Nadu. So it certainly is useful from a decision-making perspective. So do names make a difference? Yes, but perhaps not for the reasons that one might otherwise think. Uh, what about sun signs? How many people think the sun sign makes a difference to the marks? One, two, three. How many people think it does not? Three. Okay, how many people? Okay, the vast majority of people. Much more so than the numerology crowd. Uh, no, actually the sun sign makes a huge difference. <coughs> Pretty massive. On average, June bonds score the lowest. September bonds score the highest. And the difference is a whopping 10 percentage points out of, uh, you know, 120 marks out of 1200. Now, this is a pattern that you'll observe almost any way you slice and dice the data. That was for 2011, but every year from 2007 to 2014, same pattern. Break it up by district, same pattern. Break it up by gender, same pattern. By subject, same pattern. Class 10 versus class 12, same pattern. Karnataka, same pattern. Andhra Pradesh, same pattern. CBSC across the country, same pattern. ICSC across the country, same pattern. Any which way you slice and dice the data. And some of you would have guessed what's happening here. It's the same thing that Malcolm Gladwell talks about in his book, Outliers. It's the age factor. What's happening is that schools are opening in July, and the June bonds are six years, one month old at the time of entrance to class one. They just make it. The July bonds could go either way. The September, August and September bonds are five years, 10 months, or five years, 11, 11 months old at that time. And they're told, no, you don't quite make the cutoff. Come back next year. At which point, they are the oldest in the batch. And that difference of one year at six is massive. They are better built physically, more mature emotionally, more well, better developed intellectually. 
to the point that this difference of one year at class 6 is causing a 10 percentage point difference in class 12. Now you would wonder is the education system not doing anything about it, I mean aren't we bridging the gap. Turns out that it is making things worse because if you look at this difference in class 6, it is only 5 percentage points. It is effectively growing, not shrinking. Which begs the question what should we do about it, right. Now data does not have an immediate answer to that. If you look at two possible approaches, right? one approach is to say okay, therefore let me split into sections based on their age. So the oldest children go to class A, the youngest children go to class F and that way we will be able to teach them according to their needs. But then on the other hand, some people say, look, you are doing the exact opposite of what you should be doing. The whole problem arises because there is an age cutoff and now you are talking about month cutoffs. What you should instead be doing is going for something like the Montessori method where you take all children from ages 6 to 9 and have them intermingle and learn from each other. Now we do not know which is a more effective mechanism, but what we do know is that there is only one factor which has a larger influence than age on the average mark and that is whether the child is SCST or not. Nothing else has the kind of influence that the age has. And since age and birthdays were so interesting, we said let us just take a look at the pattern of births across the world. So specifically the US, if we take, we took about 15 years worth of uh, birth data and said are births random? We would expect them to be uniformly distributed across the calendar, but are they in fact uniformly distributed? Right? So this is the pattern of births. The majority of the births are happening in September. Now this is a known phenomenon. Most conceptions happen during the winter holiday seasons and nine months later is when the kids are born. <laughs> <coughs> but what's weird is that there are very few births during the Christmas holiday seasons, during the November Thanksgiving holidays, during the New Year holidays, during the Independence Day holidays. I mean this half reads like a holiday calendar rather than a birth calendar. <laughs> Which too can be explained. Doctors and hospitals don't want to be disturbed and a reasonable proportion of births are C-section births so you can move the dates around a little bit to suit your convenience, to suit the parents convenience and so on. So, but it's not just the doctors and hospitals. Notice the, stri the, notice the stripe on the 13th of any month. <laughs> Superstition. You don't want your kids to be born on an unlucky day. Right? You don't want your kids to be born on April Fool's Day either. <laughs> but Feb 14th, Valentine's Day, that's a good day for a child to be born on. St. <laughs> Patrick's Day, that's a good day for a child to be born on. So if the US can be this superstitious, what's India like? <clears throat> that's the pattern for India. <laughs> Nobody seems to be born in the month of August. Which is a mystery which will vanish when I tell you that this is the same data as a couple of slides ago, school admission data. Think about it, if your kid's born in August and schools open in July, parent choices. Wait for a year and you know keep your noisy kid at home or fudge the dates a little bit. Now I'm not saying that the dates are fudged just because there's a huge percentage of births that appear to be there in the second half of May and the first half of June. Notice these stripes on the 5th, the 10th, the 15th, the 20th and the 25th. <laughs> when people cook up numbers, they cook up round numbers. Which has an impact on the child's marks. If you overlay the average marks of the children born on these days, who say they are the born on the 5th, the 10th, the 20th, etc. tend to do significantly worse. Not because there is anything wrong with these birthdays, but because they have a higher proportion of younger kids who have been squeezed into the, these birthdays and are suffering as a result. In fact, June the 1st is the most common birthday in India, official record wise. Okay. <laughs> it's more common than the second most common birthday by about 50 percent, which is like huge. And the second most common birthday is Jan the 1st. Now Jan the 1st, however, is mostly a rural phenomenon. It's, you know, the parents don't know the exact date of birth, the school has to fill in a date, so they just put in Jan the 1st. But June the 1st is primarily an urban phenomenon driven mainly by the need to get the child into school early and you can see what it's doing to their marks, right. Having said that, let me also say that I have nothing against people who are born on June the 1st. I was speaking to a banker uh, <laughs> at Chennai and he said after I told him about this, he said look just stay where you are, okay. Waited. He brought a girl in, said do you know who this is? She's the CA gold medalist last year, June the 1st born. <laughs> so I'm sure June the 1st borns are very smart, uh, I'm merely saying that this, if somebody's official records say that they are June the 1st, there is a pretty good chance that there is a higher chance that their births fudged, but it's fudged when compared to any of the other days. So what we've been doing here is showing the data, exposing data in the form of charts for people to be able to see a pattern that would not have otherwise been obvious through numbers and all of these, both the education data, the uh, uh, electricity data, were all examples where the data, the volume of data was reasonable in people were unable to draw the same insights that you just saw 
But once it was put in the form of chart, it became sig significantly more obvious. Of course, part of the trick is in, lying, in, in identifying what the charts are that you need to show. But once the effort to, to, to create a visual representation is lower, it becomes a search problem as opposed to a construction plus search problem. And that's a little more tractable. Of course, the next step is to see how we can automate that search in itself. But let's begin by looking at the nature of the output rather than the mechanism, which is having searched it, how does one communicate that? That's typically in the form of a story, an explanation. And what form do these stories take? Let me give you an example of how <coughs> stories can be shared. Uh, here's an example of what happened during the various budgets, on the day of the budget. So if I were to take the day of the 2004, or the 2005, or the 2006, or the 2007 budget, right, the, mark, the stock markets react in a certain way. And on the day of the budget, every sector between the morning to the evening could rise, could fall. And what we have here is a picture where the size of each box represents the market capitalization of the sector, and the color represents the percentage to which it's grown or shrunk. So in this case, metals and mining, which is out here, has not had a great day. But information technology has had a pretty good day, and tobacco has had a pretty good day as well. If you look at it across the years, so for example, in 2009, almost every sector has had a bad day, except for tobacco. If I look at 2010, almost every sector has had a good day, except for tobacco. 2011, tobacco has had an exceptional performance. 2012, again, almost every sector has done bad except for tobacco. What is it about tobacco during the Congress regime that seems so different, right? Oh, it, it did not uh, persist beyond that. I mean, uh, 2013 and 2014, this, it, tobacco doesn't stand out. In fact, you can barely notice that difference. No, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't you know if, if you're waiting for an answer. Um, but what we're doing here is not just providing a visual, but also an annotation around it, which is to say that look, metals and mining grew the most by so much, followed by tobacco, which grew by so much. This in industry shrank by so much. And an overview of what's happening, effectively an explanation along with the story to help people understand what's happening, to help people focus on what's happening, effectively a story along with, an, with a visual. The thing is, there are many techniques by which we aid data consumption. Data in itself is one. Visuals are another. Narratives are a third leg. And it's when they combine together that we get the most effective form of communication. And narratives are particularly critical when you want to convince people of a certain specific thing, if you want people to focus on a specific area. Narratives come in many forms. Another <coughs> representation here, for instance, talks about what were the parliamentary decisions that were taken uh, in the Congress's first term versus the second term. So this is based on mining of all of the uh, parliamentary decisions. The keywords were extracted. And each circle represents one keyword. The size represents how often it was talked about. There were lots of mentions of projects and schemes, relatively fewer mentions of bills, um, approvals, services, et cetera. And they're horizontally positioned based on how often a given term appears in the well, pre-2009 during the Congress's first term, as opposed to the second term. Uh, which allows us to answer questions like, in what manner was the UPA's first term different from the UPA's second term? Right? So if I take, for example, agreement, the word agreement is almost entirely there in the left half. In other words, the first term, and not at all there in the second half, indicating that when the UPA government got into power, they just happily went around roaming and signing international agreements. And the second term, they started getting a little more real, of course, which is the uncharitable interpretation. But practice, there was a lot more focus on international agreements in the first term as opposed to the second term. On the other hand, there was a lot more focus in the second term on national highway development policy, laning, etc. In other words, infrastructure, specifically related to roadways, were the focus of parliamentary debates that existed in the second term that did not exist in the first term. If I look at the balance of power between the center and state, the word central is a little more to the left, and the word state is a lot more to the right. First term, they were taking decisions that were more related to the center. Clearly, the balance of power shifted towards the states, and that became the focus during the second term, allowing one to, among other things, pick certain stories out of this and communicate this. Now, I've picked two stories to tell you. There are many other stories in there, but the point of an explanation is to narrow down and focus, to tell specific points and stories out of that. <coughs> Another story that, uh, actually, how am I doing for time? <coughs> Uh, yet another one was at a restaurant where one of the problems that they had was, tell me how my sales is evolving. So uh, we were looking at the sales across time and said, let's plot it on a calendar. In one of their restaurants, this is a chain of restaurants, in one of their restaurants, 
uh, we looked at the point of sale terminal. So on a calendar, you see various colors. The, the color indicates the extent of sales. Green indicates high sales. Red indicates low sales. So you and these are the two terminals in the front, two terminals in the back. Now <coughs> you'll notice certain oddities. So for example, you'll find that there's a spike on the 30th and the 31st which incidentally was very easily explained by them. They said we had a, a product launch, we called in a lot of people and therefore there was a spike in the sales in both of these counters. But then they said, look, why is there a, a spike on the ninth year that is not matched here? Now you don't have people queuing in uh, on, in just one point of sale terminal. You typically queue in on both. But then a quick look at the data explained that mystery as well. It wasn't an, a spike in volume, it was a spike in value. There were two large party orders on that day that came in and just so happened that they were on that particular counter. So the value shot up, but the number of say the, the number of bills that were produced was roughly the same. So that made sense. But the most bizarre thing for this particular chain was the fact that every Wednesday sales seems to be dipping in this particular counter. Almost as if to compensate, sales was rising in this counter, but not as much as it was dipping here. And it was a big mystery as to why that was happening. This day. We'll do a bit of investigation. We'll get back to you on this. Three weeks later, they got back and said, the person that's running this counter takes half day off every Wednesday. The manager does not repay them. And obviously, the queue just jumps over to this side. And interestingly enough, the manager seemed to be very happy about Wednesdays because he would see a fairly long queue stretching out, going all the way to the street. Now, this is an area where there are a relatively large number of restaurants. When the queue, once the queue goes beyond a certain size, people drop off. And as a result, they'd been having a net loss, a net re reduction in sales every Wednesday for almost seven months with the manager of the restaurant being particularly happy about Wednesdays, given the size of the queue that he was seeing. Right? And these kinds of, yeah, you get that issue. Uh, a, a similar pattern for banks was pretty interesting. Uh, we were looking at the performance of loans that were disbursed. And it turned out that loans that were disbursed after the 20th consistently did well. All the loans disbursed up to the 20th of any month didn't do so well. All the loans disbursed starting from the 21st were doing like really well. And once they spotted that pattern, it was pretty easy to explain that because it, and it was very simple. The, their policy was that all the sales up to the 20th counts towards your incentive from a calculation perspective. From the 21st, any loan sales that you make does not count towards your incentive because incentive calculation is a 10 day batch process. So up to the 20th, I have an incentive to get in every single loan, no matter how bad it is to increase my volumes. But from the 21st onwards, I'm not gonna bother getting in arbitrary loans that are difficult. I'm just gonna get in what loans come in easy. And the average quality of these loans tends to be much better than the quality of loans that I'm trying to squeeze in the first 20 days of the month, so in which case, we actually have a counterproductive policy for this bank. They're computing the incentives based on volume of loans. And clearly it has an impact on quality. Luckily, this IT policy makes it easy for us to spot the difference between a regular loan and a high quality, uh, sorry, and a, and a poor quality loan that comes in. In all of these cases, the objective is for people to stretch out a thread to allow people to understand what the meaning is without them having to think about what the chart means, about what the data is, etc., and effectively completes the consumption story. But sometimes what you want is not to convey a message, but allow people to identify the message by themselves, which means that you've got to provide an interface for exploration and an underlying data set for exploration. To give an example of what I mean by an exploration, uh, let me talk about one of the earliest explorations that we did, which was on pure text. We took the Mahabharata and said, let's see what we can do with it. I mean, this is ab about as close as one can get to big data in the text world, right? <laughs> so uh, we took the epic and broke it down into the 18 chapters and within each one of those, the various sections and the length of each box represents the number of words in that section. And then extracted the entities out of it, specifically the characters and said, let's see where a particular character is mentioned. So that's all of the mentions of Yudhishthira in the epic. And he's clearly there everywhere. And this is obviously a book about Yudhishthira. But you can say, OK, that in particular is a chapter about Yudhishthira. Whereas if I take Bhima, again, mentioned in almost all the places, but there are entire sections where he's not mentioned. Uh, <coughs> incidentally, you, sh you should take a look at the epic. Almost the entire story is condensed in, into the first half. And the second half is quite bizarre. Uh, but using this, I can answer questions like, for example, um, did Karna have an affair with Draupadi? Right? I can easily pick the places where Karna and Draupadi are mentioned together 
and there's probably like a half a dozen spots where they're mentioned together and read through you know, just click on that see what exactly is mentioned here and just for your information no there's no mention whatsoever of them having even spoken to each other barring their uh, you know, what the swayamvara uh, incident they've ne never even spoken to each other so no no <coughs> i can also infer things like let's take uh, nala as a character now nala is mentioned in just one tiny spot in the epic nowhere else so without knowing anything about the epic or reading about it, I can conclude that there's a short story about Nala. He's a peripheral character and he's just mentioned these spots. Now if I look at Damayanti, Damayanti is appearing in exactly the same spots that Nala is. So again, without reading the epic, I can conclude that these two characters are tightly related. They are effectively very close to each other in contrast with, let's say, Nala and Agastya, who are mentioned in very different spots, which allows us to compute a network relationship. So if I take the top 30 characters, for example, and say who are they and how are they related to each other, who are the peripheral characters. So it's relatively easy to see that the central characters in, involve Duryodhana, Pandu, Yudhishthira, Krishna, Drona, Sanjaya, etc. Whereas people like Janmejaya, Narada, etc. they are more peripheral characters. Sorry if it's not too clear. But Narada is really connected only to a couple of people. One is Vyasa, the other is Krishna, which is understandable. Uh, Kunti, uh, uh, okay, let's say, okay, Gandhari. Gandhari is only connected to Vidura, Dhritarashtra, and Kunti. And it's interesting that she's talking more to her brother-in-law than her husband. We can ask, answer, answer the question, which Pandava is Draupadi the closest to? Right? So there's Draupadi. Uh, Sahadeva is not too far away. Nakula is not too far away. Bhima is pretty close. Yudhishthira is not too far away. It's interesting that the Pandava that she's furthest away from is Arjuna, <laughs> which sounds counterintuitive, right? I mean, they're supposed to be really close and all that. Uh, <laughs> but fact is that the percentage of times that Draupadi is mentioned with Arjuna or vice versa is relatively small and Arjuna is in fact mentioned with a whole lot of other people. He has enough other interests to command his attention. Uh, in fact, this we realized when we spoke to a, a Marathi investment banker. She said, look, uh, do you know, uh, investment banker from Pune, she said, do you know there's a Marathi play on this very same topic. It's the Mahabharata from Draupadi's point of view. And the theme is about how while she liked Arjuna, there was no mention about Arjuna having liked her. And the play was largely about her feeling, you know, by and large, ignored by Arjuna. So, which is an inter interesting perspective, which we would not have known about had the data not shown us this and you know, allowed us to explore an alternate version of it. Uh, another thing, taking the same network diagram, right? one of the things that we do is uh, recruit from the uh, <coughs> Python community, mostly based on GitHub. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, GitHub is sort of like a Facebook for programmers. Instead of uploading photos, people upload programs. <coughs> and this is the social network on GitHub of Bangalore, where every circle represents one person. The color of the circle represents the language in which they program. So the uh, <coughs> blues are JavaScript programmers, the oranges are Java programmers, and so on. And the size of the circle represents the number of followers they have. So the larger the circle, the more influential that person is. And the lines, of course, represent the follower network. So you can see that Bangalore is a reasonably tightly connected city. Now, this is not common. If I, if I were to take, let's say, uh, Noida, <coughs> reasonably large number of programmers, but they're barely talking to each other. If I take Gurgaon and add it to the mix, you have even more programmers, but significantly fewer connections. Now, I'm not passing any judgment about the places. Some places are just less connected, right? Uh, so in, in many ways, Bangalore is a bit of an exception. Uh, you do find places like Mumbai uh, somewhat connected. Uh, Mumbai is probably uh, third most connected, uh, Chennai is not too bad, uh, Pune is not too bad. <coughs> in fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a city quite like Bangalore, in Asia at least. Uh, Singapore is probably the only one that comes close to the kind of density that Bangalore has in terms of connections. And the thing about these connections is that you can reach out to one person and then just through their network reach out to many other people, Now, which helps us from a recruiting perspective because even if we are not, not able to recruit a specific person, we can quickly branch out and get to other people. So if, in fact, specifically looking at the Python programmers in the city of Singapore, that's uh, space. And we'd start with somebody like Martin, who incidentally runs uh, PyCon in Singapore. And from him, branch out to a few other people. Or in Bangalore, uh, <coughs> we'd start out with, OK, that's me, um, <laughs> uh, no fun. And then branch out from there and get to the other people fairly quickly, right? which is helpful. But what if I were to take uh, a combined circle? So let's take Singapore and Bangalore put together and see how these cities interact. So instead of coloring by the language, let's color by the city. 
And you'll find that while internally they have a strong network, across these cities there's barely any conversations. There are all the Bangaloreans in blue, all the uh, Singaporeans in orange. And there's probably about half a dozen people that are connected across. And if you just go about shooting these six people or so, the, 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 the cities are completely cut off, very disconnected. This is not the case for uh, many other cities. If I were to say, let's say, Bangalore and Chennai, which among other things are geographically proximate, but there's also the country factor, right? Same country. Now, here you can barely distinguish the network. You can sort of say, okay, yeah, the Chennaiites in green are slightly more to the top right, and the Bangaloreans are slightly more to the bottom left, but there's such a tight integration that you don't really think of this as two distinct networks, which is a kind of exploration that allows us to see what's happening in various non-structured data context. So for example, we were looking at uh, post the Hyderabad bomb blast. The set of people that were making calls only to each other as a small group and stopped making calls four hours prior to the blast. This was in fact a specific uh, request given by the CBI. Uh, in another case, we were looking at how organizations are transacting money between each other. This was in uh, a piece of work with the Serious Fraud Investigation Office. Uh, to see whether there are cyclical flows of money across companies to see if they can be highlighted for uh, for fraud. Uh, yet another case was in an organization to look at email flows. Are there certain clusters of people who are communicating very less in terms of email? And one of the representations, uh, it ended up that the US retail team and the UK retail team were barely having any conversations with each other. Now, can, how far can one take this is a big question. Uh, the furthest that we took it was uh, on the media side. Uh, you may have seen the uh, CNN IBN election coverage last year uh, for the general elections where uh, Rajdeep Sajay Sardesai and Bhupesh Jove had this huge 92 inch screen that was pro provided by Microsoft and they were doing uh, live uh, <coughs> election analytics. So Microsoft hired us to create all the software that is behind the scenes. So we created these visuals. And the challenge was can an anchor become an analyst? Can an anchor take a call? and directly answer questions from the public without any prior preparation, simply by virtue of being able to use an interface that is simple enough. Uh, incidentally, the bearded figure that you see in the background is me making my first national television appearance. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a hack there, I you know, went behind the screen pretending to watch the TV, but I was actually calling home saying, look, turn on to see an IP and let's see me on screen. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of things came out of this. So uh, one of the things, one of the questions uh, that came up was, where do we have the largest number of candidates standing for elections? So uh, Bhupendra Chave was playing around with this. He provided a quick answer initially and then uh, went on to explore this. So uh, this specifically is a view of the assembly elections, the Tamil Nadu assembly elections in particular, where in 1967, each circle represents one constituency. So that's Perambalur, for instance, and that's uh, Varahur, and so on. The color represents the party that won, the yellows are DMK, uh, and the size represents the number of candidates that stood for election. So totally across the state, there were 778 candidates. And you have Perambalur where there were, or, okay, uh, there was, yeah, Perambalur where you have as many as 10 candidates standing for elections. Uh, and let's take the next year, 1971. Not too much difference in terms of number of candidates, but you see a sudden spike in 1977, because now at this point the colors also change. That's because a new party has come in, the ADMK. And that's increased the overall participation. It's almost doubled. Uh, <coughs> next year, not too much of a change. Next year, now we have one constituency where there are as many as 90 con uh, candidates suddenly standing for elections. Now, 90 is a pretty large number, mostly independents, obviously. And at this point, you can't easily just look at a ballot sheet and pick your candidate. You've got to flip through a little bit. So you have a mini booklet of sorts. <coughs> uh, overall increase in 1989, but nothing quite stands out. But in 1991, two constituencies stand out. Pallipet and Avarakuruchi with almost 250 candidates each. So at this point, you have a much larger booklet. You have a few A4 sheets that you have to flip through. Uh, but all of this pales in comparison with the Madakuruchi election, where 1,033 candidates stood for elections. Uh, at this point, it's probably not a booklet. It's a book. It's probably the telephone directory of Madakuruchi. Uh, and uh, if you look at the names of the candidates that stood for election there, right? so that's what it looks like. Palnisami C, Palnisami C, Palnisami C, Palnisami C, Palnisami C. I mean, if you are Palnisami C, how do you figure out which Palnisami C you are to vote for yourself? Right? <laughs> because you don't have a symbol. It's obviously one of these Palnisami Cs, but uh, you know, which probably led to a bit of confusion because despite there having been 1,033 candidates who stood for elections, there were 88 candidates who got zero votes, meaning they didn't even vote for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> which <laughs> is a bit of a problem. <laughs> so. Recap.
The point is to allow people to understand data. And there are different ways in which it can be done. And each of these ways has its own pros and cons. Some of them allow people to explore and, and understand it by themselves. Some of it make it easy for people to consume the data because they're told a certain message. And what we've looked at are various techniques that allow these, at least at a cursory level. Point is that ultimately you want to lead to a certain kind of action. In order to get to an action, you need to understand why that's happening. And that's an insight. And the focus that I've been taking is taking the, the, the jump from the data to insights in a specific manner, specifically around the consumption man. But that by no means is an end to itself. It's when it translates to an action that there really is an end to it. But this particular leap of data to insights through form of visualization today is being aided by three techniques, uh, all related to automation. Firstly, visualizations are starting to get automated. The choice of visual representation as well as the plethora of representations are becoming are both uh, increasing and uh, it's becoming much easier to create more custom, more sophisticated visualizations. Analysis is getting automated. We no longer are looking at a domain where a human has to explore the data. Instead, we look at patterns and allow systems to explore that instead. And lastly, narratives are getting automated as well. You no longer have to have an output as, uh, <coughs> as a set of numbers or even visuals. The entire story can be written by a system. And that's thanks to the improvements in narrative techniques. And when I say written, I mean that purely as a construct. I mean, instead, it could be a video. And you have companies like Narrative Sciences, for example, which actually produce videos out of data in which a human-like voice is talking through the results of analysis. All of these steps are taking us towards significantly better data consumption. And what I'd ask you to do is to play around with some of this data play around with some of the representations. The tool set that we have today, while it's still nascent, is much more mature than what we had half a decade ago. And you'd be surprised at the kinds of things that you can do. You'd be surprised at the ease at which you can do it. But more importantly, I think you'd be surprised at the kinds of insights that you can get with data that hasn't been explored too much. Do play around with data. You might find it a lot more fun than you think. Thank you. Not sure how we are doing on time. Uh, so <laughs> the pattern has changed in urban areas, not so much in the rural areas yet. Having said that, see, there are two kinds of lags that we have. I'm looking at data for children who are taking class 10 or class 12 exams, which obviously means that they've registered 10 or 12 years ago. So uh, a better data set would be the National Achievement Survey data set, which we are looking at, uh, we're hoping to get our hands on, where at least we'll have registration data for class 3. Health data would be even better. Uh, <clears throat> at the moment, we don't have access to that. But from what little we've seen, the trend is that in urban areas, this is becoming much more prevalent. Um, having said that, the enforcement is still not rigid. It's only now that the education department and the NCRT and so on, they've woken up to the fact that this sort of a behavior is pretty common and it's counterproductive. So the enforcement is beginning to get in place. But by and large, schools would not insist on a birth certificate. Not only that, in fact, in many cases, you actually have the option of changing your birth date at, in time for your class 10 exams. Right? In case you've given the wrong date for whatever reason, right? feel free to correct your date before your class 10 exam so that it will reflect your real date. So at, at the moment, it's still fairly uh, lax. I think it will be at least five years before we start to see the impact of any tightening of policy. So the de facto uh, platform at the moment for anything beyond Excel is Tableau. Uh, uh, by and large, for any programmer today, if you're going to get into the details, then D3 is a reasonably good choice. So between these two, uh, I'd argue that they are the incumbents. Uh, the challengers uh, on the programmatic side, that's an easy one. It's uh, effectively, so uh, let's just take the course of history for programmatic visualizations. Yeah. <laughs> no, 
by and large, it's been steered by Jeffrey here, of uh, well, formerly of Stanford, now of University of Washington. And it began with Flare, Prefuse, Protovis, D3, now Vega, Vega Light, Voyager, Polar, uh, Polestar. Uh, <coughs> so the words that you've been hearing so far would have been Protovis, uh, Flare, D3. The words you will be hearing so far on the programmatic side will be Vega, Vega Light, Voyager. And there's, there's no doubt that that's one stream or stack to follow. Uh, eventually, the tools will get simpler and simpler. Uh, <coughs> on the soft, on, on the construction side, for a non-programmer, uh, the tool set is far from uh, complete or good. Uh, <coughs> personally, my favorite is Excel. It's it's a ridiculously sophisticated programming environment, uh, and the kind of stuff. And ninety percent of the charts that I showed you here can be done and have been done by us on Excel. Uh, <coughs> and uh, Tableau comes a close second in that uh, the advantage with Excel over Tableau is that you can create pretty much, you can program it, right? as opposed to Tableau, which provides a rich ecosystem that you can tweak. So if you're, if you're a power user, uh, you, if you're a power user, then you'd go for D3. If you're somewhere in between and familiar enough with Excel, you'd stick with Excel. And if you're getting started on data visualization and you want to explore, the, your focus is more on the data than the visualization, then you would go for Tableau. Uh, there are two domains of data visualization. One where you're trying to, your focus is on the data and you're trying to get the insights out of it. In that case, the sophistication of the visual doesn't matter. You pick a few common visuals and you work with those. The other is communicating the data. In which case, if it's geographic data, I want to show it in a map in a specific way. If it's floor plan data, I want to show it in a plan. Uh, I want to show it in the domain that I understand it in, right? The, the number of, if the number of people that are seeing the visual is much larger than the number of people that are creating the visual. You need a very flexible and powerful tool. Today, that tool set exists only with extensive programming. And uh, <coughs> let's see, uh, R has a pretty decent ecosystem. Uh, processing used to have a pretty decent ecosystem. I don't think I can recommend processing anymore, given uh, the state of that ecosystem. Julia is emerging with a reasonably good ecosystem. But I don't think there's any doubt that the JavaScript stack is the way to go today. On the other hand, <coughs> if you're consuming the visuals yourself, then the sophistication of the visuals doesn't matter. Excel or Tableau would work just fine. So, do you distinguish uh, any approach or any visual geek in Uh, let me try and answer the question as well as I can. The uh, difference is a very strong one, operational versus analytical, and we see that all the time. I'll give you an example of an operational dashboard, right? Uh, <coughs> not quite a dashboard, of a, uh, an operational visual. Uh, <coughs> let's take cricket data. So if I want to see the strike rates of every player uh, uh, in one day internationals, that's what it looks like. The size of the box represents the number of runs scored in one day internationals. The color represents the speed at which they've scored. So I can see that Sehwag's a pretty fast scorer. Tendulkar's not too bad. Ravi Shastri, as we very well know, is slow. Mohindra Marnath, obviously, is slow. Uh, and you can start drilling down into the individual data points and so on. Now, what this does is represents a snapshot in time. And I can use a representation like this, for example, to see. Tell me what's, tell me the prioritized performance. Take a branch, take all the branches across all the zones and tell me which ones are growing, which ones are shrinking. Now, that's a classic operation dashboard. Or if I want to look at, let's say, employee performance, show me all the divisions within that, show me all the employees, and I want to be able to explore and evaluate. The data changes reasonably rapidly. The people that are looking at it are focused on point transactions. And the key question to answer is, tell me what I should be focusing on. In contrast, analytical representations have a very different question to answer, which is, tell me why something is happening. Right. And I am going to show you an example of an analytical uh, representation without giving you any explanation of what this is. Uh, so. Well, be a brief explanation. So one of the questions is, for example, why do our aircraft cargo get delayed? So one way of looking at it is because of shift. So night shifts are pretty bad. Why are night shifts bad? Because night shifts do really bad on Sundays. Why on Sundays do they do bad? Because they primarily carry a cargo of type RPP and TDZ, TDS, which they tend to do badly on. 
why do these do badly, and so on. So you can effectively start drilling down and exploring. Now, the difference is that I'm not going to look at this every day or every week or even every month. I'm probably going to look at this every year and say, okay, therefore, based on this, how do I change my approach? The question is different. However, having said that, there is no hard and fast rule that says that a certain question must be answered only by a certain type of representation. So what we find is that representations that work well for operational dashboards reasonably often work well for analytical dashboards as well. However, there are also representations such as this one that work almost exclusively for analytical dashboards or analytical uh, uh, questions as opposed to operational questions. So how do we approach it? We first figure out the nature of the question and very early on sort it out into whether this is a question that answers the question what is happening or where is it happening as opposed to why is it happening and how is it happening. And based on that, identify what the relevant set of visual representations could be. There is a bit of an overlap, but not too much of an overlap between these. And that's what drives the rest of both the analysis as well as the vision.